Hi everybody, I'm TC, and someone stole my hat. Ooh, that's bad. However, I have a backup hat that represents my love of New York. That's good. It also does not contain the restraints on my anger. That's bad. But it also makes me remember all of the good moments I've had since I've been in America. That's good. They also remind me of the fact that all of the dark forces that dwell within my dark pyramid are warriors by night that can slaughter you all within seconds. That's bad. Can I go now? Anyway, welcome everyone back to the showcase, but this time, it's not just gonna be me doing something, it's me and that annoying asshole doing things. And what are we doing this time? Well, we're gonna be talking about two series at the same time. Making this the second largest showcase episode on the channel. And why are we doing this? Because we found two shows that are amazing. I remember the first one. My brother DMW Renka helped me out finding the second one at a random. Mostly because we were watching too many episodes of Death Battle. So we gonna be hitting you guys with a full-on episode hitting two shows at once. Now that's out of the way, let's get to the opening credits, shall we? Anyway, hello everybody and welcome back to Showcase, where we discuss everything from films, TV shows, plays, whatever have you. But right now we're going to start off with a bit of something that kind of hits home at the Black Pyramid. So we're going to be starting the first half of this episode talking about Static Shock. A show that kind of went from this underground thing that not a lot of people knew about to a household phenomenon for many people that wanted more diversity coming to the television waves. Starting out in 2000 or 2002, if you want to be more technical, all the way up to 2004, Static Shock was a show created by Dwayne McDuffie, who also created the comic book within Milestone, which had the character also a Static Shock, kind of growing into the whole minority market of superheroes. Although DC did have many different heroes under their label that were minorities, they never got the same thing that they got with Dwayne McDuffie, who also made such notable characters such as Icon and the Nightbreed. Nerd! Those being more African-American centric characters in an urban landscape to kind of showcase the things that not a lot of people get within most DC comics because it's mostly debates on Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, the Green Lantern Corps, Flash, those sort of characters. At least back then. However, when the animated series was finally picked up for production, this is when the whole boom of We Needed More Diversity came into play. And I'm not saying that just from the whole Justice League series that came out along the same lines of, uh, lines of that year to kind of give more diversity and whatnot for more heroes, but I am saying that, did, that this did kind of help with the appeal to kind of make people want more rather than just getting the same generic brand. Sure, we had various people that came up as minority characters, but they weren't the same as this show, at least in our opinion. And it kind of showcased as well within its four season one run. English, motherfucker, do you speak it? Ah, uh, yeah. So, how now that I've gotten that whole entire trivia out of the way, what can I say about this show? Well, we're gonna have to start off with the beginning. And with that, I will start off with that. We've got ourselves a winner. So the story for the animated version starts off like this. Virgil is the only son of his father, Robert Hawkins, and he only has his older sister, Sharon Hawkins. What happened to his mom, I'll dive into momentarily, but I will say it's kind of like how Disney treats how the parents disappear in a way, but in a more realistic light. Well, that's not fair at all. I'm sorry. We don't give a fuck. 
And before we end all that, this is how the story kind of starts off from the pilot episode. Virgil is simply a regular kid just trying to attend high school, but he's getting bullied a lot. He's getting his ass kicked a lot. He's pretty much made into this giant punching bag that just worms around the halls with only his friend Richie, although in the comics his name is Rick Stone, and they're kind of trying to make it a different thing. I'll, I'll dive into the character analyzation soon, though. I'm not going to try to derail myself now. And during this whole process, he's kind of drawn into the, into the gang life because they're protecting him from one of his bigger adversaries by the name of Francis, who keeps picking on Virgil for the stupidest reasons. But that's high school. That's happened to everybody. And it kind of progresses further and further into the darker nature as they're trying to bring him into a gang war that's happening in the fictional city of Dakota. Where is Dakota located? Somewhere in the DC universe that no one really can comprehend all that well. Still though, when he's dragged into this gang war, they're giving him a gun, but due to his own personal history with weapons of mass, of, of like mass domestic destruction, as I will call them, like bats, guns, tasers, your mom, all of those just kind of go into a darker light with him, so he discards the gun, obviously, but during this gang war between... I don't know what gang they're talking about for the life of me. I've watched the series seven times in a row, and they never clarify the gangs, if I'm honest. It's just local gangs, I suppose. And as soon as the police try to intervene, they end up hitting something that kind of creates this giant big bang effect, where they kind of create these metahumans, or bang babies. Because it kind of gives off its own big bang effect, or all the gas that hits the city all throughout the docks just hitting all the people within the thing not the thing the docks and it just creates a whole new field of worries and troubles for Virgil that he can never understand so much so that it leads to him being a bang baby I'm personally calling him a metahuman because that's what he gives all the other kind of terms for the people still though he doesn't really understand about this change in his system until he wakes up the next day and he discovers that he has electrokine electrokinetic abilities and also with electromagnetic kinesis which is the ability to not only control electricity but electromagnetic pulses making him be able to lift up objects with just the simple touch of electricity and making it magnetized so that he himself can wield it such as making a like a trash lid his own glider, or a manhole cover, or even using pipes and stuff to make barriers and stuff, or even creating an entire electromagnetic barrier around himself for defensive, re defensive reasons. All of those things that he can pretty much utilize as his own living electric man. Which is why I sometimes like to compare him with Cole McGrath from Infamous, because it's kind of like, if it weren't for a Static Shock or Black Vulcan from the original DC Comics run of the Super Friends, they wouldn't have the Cole McGraths or any other electromagnetic characters in American history at all. With that kind of staple, it is a good thing. Still though, season one, as I'm pretty much trying to get across, it's only the it's only like the beginning plate for Virgil because unlike most heroes that DC or Marvel kind of creates, with Virgil it's kind of a different struggle. He's not someone that's alienated for some idiotic reason and he doesn't come off as a loner. He's simply just a regular person that still makes friends and is actually trying to juggle his life in a realistic way. Are you fucking taking notes, Spider-Man? And even during the animated series portions, he himself is trying to make sure everyone in his life is taken care of. His friend Frida, his friend Richie, his friend, as I will use air quotes, friend, because he has feelings for her, Daisy. Every person that he meets, even his family, he's trying to make sure that everything is juggled perfectly, where he can do his schoolwork, save the city of Dakota, and keep the peace but not without getting some notable enemies. One of them being his always present anti-foil anti of Hot Streak. 
And if it's not Hot Streak, who was Francis in the beginning, it's this enigma sort of character from a majority of the series who's actually a living shadow by the name of Ebon. It serves our needs quite well. Call me Ebon, master of shadow and darkness. Not very modest, are you? No time for modesty, hero. And then it's just a snippet of Ebon's slick moments, trust me. When you watch the series, you see how slick and sadistically evil he can be, and why he would pretty much be on a lot of people's top 10 list of villains within fictional medium for American audiences. For me, he would be in my top 13 villains list of all times which is going to come out very soon after two other top 13s I'm going to be working on in the meanwhile. Still, with each and every passing moment within, episode, within this episode that we meet Ebon and we get through more of seasons 1 and 2, we get to see how Static is in the beginnings. Like most other heroes, he does have his stumbling points, unless you're talking about Batman, but let's face it, with Batman, he's a fucking ninja who can slip through everything like that. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. Still, it kind of does come up in a good enough light where we see how well Static is becoming. He's meeting more heroes within the DC universe. He's getting more recognition, fame with his own hometown of being someone that's competent enough to work with the police. And he's even trying to make sure that what happened to other people with Alva Industries, the company responsible for the Big Bang because their toxins by the docks, doesn't keep happening. With the various different antagonists of the week coming in and the returning of his own arch enemies coming into fruition more and more from time to time. And it gets even more in depth in his own personal life to what he's struggling with, such as the season finale for season two kind of showcasing why he hates guns. Gun. Okay, put it down. That's not funny. Lots of things aren't funny. Breaking my computer wasn't funny. Shoving me in the locker wasn't funny. Jimmy, you're right. I I'm sorry, man. No, you're not. And that kind of goes into where I will stop the season analyzation and go into character analyzation for this one moment. Shut up and get to the point. The one reason why Static, kind of like how Batman is with no guns, Static kind of goes into the whole thing of no guns because he lost his mother in a Dakota riot, which is kind of an allusion to many of the riots that happens within the U.S. His mom was one of the ambulance drivers and EMTs just trying to save as many people as they could, but because of a random person just shooting off because they wanted to, his mom was caught in the crossfire and she died a hero. For many people, that is where they would stop at the whole guns being right or wrong thing and just being tools of evil. Which is why I have a weird thing with guns because I've known what it's like to use guns for the wrong purpose along with seeing what happens as the after effect. Weaponry in, its, in and of itself I can't say is a bad thing because when you look around the studio from time to time or you hear us during our, like our let's plays or live streams, we have weapons. That's not what I'm trying to say about anti-weapons. What I want is to pretty much be like what they're trying to do with the message from Static. Be responsible and not try to use weapons for the stupidest things. When you do something in a smarter light, you end up having smarter resolution with things. You don't need to always have weapons in a story to make your character badass, Red Hood. You don't need to have weapons to make your character seem more complex, Kratos. You don't need weapons to make every single moment within the series seem smarter, The Punisher. Hey, bite my glorious golden ass! You don't need weapons to make your character the, the most OP bastard in existence. If that were the case, Many of the symbols of power within each country would have them just surrounded by every weapon in existence rather than their own bare fist. That is where true power lies, when you rely on your own body to signify what you want to do with life, not with what tools you use. But still, that is where the analyzation will stop for now, as we continue into Season 3, as we start off with what was my 
kickoff point for season three being static in Africa, where in this first th- first two episodes of season three, we do get the new outfit of static, which is one of my favorites, and I will be cosplaying in in the convention coming soon. But it also kind of brings into fruition a story I kind of loved when I was in Africa for a little bit of, um, I wonder... Yes, we stand on tradition, Asiba. You know well the ancient story. The spider always captures the leopard. Hello. Yeah, we kind of start off season three pretty nicely. The first episode pretty much being a big Static and Batman team up where we do get hints of the Teen Titans may or may not appearing in the series. Which never happens because of... But the second episode, we get to meet the only representation of a superhero based off of a wonderful West African myth of Anansi the Spider. Which is when he, a small little golden spider decided to talk to the most powerful wind god and saying that he wants to tell the most fantastic stories in, a, in all of existence. And all he wanted to do was get the tools necessary. So the wind god told him to gather up these few items. He had to trap something, he had to, ins- he had to snare something, and he had to... I forget the third thing, but he had to capture at least four different foes and send them into the sky. And then, once that was passed on to him, he was given not only the power of storytelling, but also of illusions, and given the title of a crafty trickster god. When given this sort of subtext for a superhero within this whole franchise, to get even people like me that are multiracial something more to look forward to, this was pretty well done. I honestly love this thing, even to the fact that they left on a really small little message at the end of the episode that I'm going to play right here. I know it's going to be like a small insignificant thing, but for me, it meant a lot, and it kind of did shape a lot of things for me back in the 2000s and 2004s that I don't think I kind of express with my brothers all that well. At least not anymore. I never knew how important it would be to meet a role model like you. Role model? Yeah, a black superhero. I don't know, it validates me somehow. Heroes come in every color, my friend. I know. It's just that sometimes I wish there was a black superhero back home for folks to look up to. Oh, but there is. And he is my hero, too. For me, I guess this series is more than just a simple cartoon. When you go throughout so much depth for this one show to pretty much showcase why guns are bad, why you shouldn't make fun of people for having dyslexia, why you should be always beyond kind but also sympathetic and no longer racist bigoted uh experimental to the people a shitty parent phone shut up all of these things when you kind of watch them as an adult growing up or just a simple person that's still feeling lost after many horrible accidents a show like this can pretty much open your eyes to many things and we're not even at the final season and yet Throughout all the times I've watched this show, no matter how old I've gotten, all the messages rang true. Dwayne McDuffie never wanted to mince words with what he was making, but even before his untimely death. When he made this show, he honestly wanted to make the best thing in the world for his fans. I cannot stress enough how much I found enjoyable about this series from start to finish. 
And the more I look at it, the more proud I feel to be a multiracial person, even if I'm no not an American by any stretch of the word. No matter where I reside in, I feel like a very validated multiracial individual just for seeing this series from the ground up, watching it progress further on into existence and becoming the icon for many people like me that want to see something where you don't have to be a certain race, a certain gender. You can just jump in and hear messages like this and just still feel validated and happy. You don't need to have a very powerful Caucasian male in a red and blue jumpsuit with a cape saying all the things that you need. You don't need all of these symbols of justice and independence. You just need someone of not just your race, but all races pretty much saying you can be a hero and do all these things right. You just don't need to be labeled as such. You are validating yourself just for existing, and this is no exception. This is what I love about this show from start to finish, and what I pretty much thrive on when I'm saying that this is where the gateway to animation begins. Good television, good messages, all of these wonderful things happening, it comes from stuff like this. And sadly, we had to have our final season. I only say sadly because from what we were building up to throughout season four, it was going to be marvelous. And when we're talking about season four, I have to pretty much say it's the cure-all season where Alva Industries is now trying to redeem themselves for what they've done, like to Alva Jr. now being a stone statue from his father being neglected, being a neglectful asshole, from him just being like, I'm a workaholic, I don't need to see or even acknowledge my child, which happens a lot in fictional medium and pretty much is addressed only in stuff like this, if I'm completely honest. And for me, when I was watching season four and when Alva Sr. finally got Alva Jr. back by the time that they were trying to say that they got the cure-all for all of the metahumans, I was both happy and sad because we finally got the full on results because we had it hinted at us throughout season three, like how we kicked off season three with a metahuman being cured. And for season four, where we just had many metahumans being cured, it kind of left a very sad, sad breath in me, especially when we were building up more and more things such as when Robert Hawkins finally admitted to the fact that he knew that Virgil was static and that his best friend, who by season three, I may add, became a superhero named Gear. So when I kind of saw the, se the series finale about how all these things were going on, I was very sad, like many other people watching the series. And then when they came out with the twist ending with the whole miniature Big Bang in the final battle scene, I might I might say, where they got their powers back. And then when we get this beautiful moment, like, oh, I can't see how beautiful this is. I'm just going to play it for you guys. I'm just going to play it for you right now. So here it is. Here is the one moment that many TV shows need to say of, like, you should renew this and reboot this to hell while saying, all these things happen, and we're going to continue. So I'm going to stop what I'm saying. I'm just going to shut up and show the clip right now. Oh, man. It's Ebon and Hot Streak. They must have sucked up so much gas they fused together. Whoa. Yeah, I don't mean to stop in the middle of that clip of how awesome that idea would be of two main antagonists fusing into one. That concept alone would make the whole series kind of evolve into a whole new step if there was a season five. 
Unfortunately, though, the funding, from what I've heard, didn't really go through enough because people weren't watching the show anymore, despite the fact it was probably one of the most popular things within DC's home, own animated universe at the time. Even more popular than Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, from what I've heard. Ne uh, needless to say, though, it was a very sad thing when they kind of ended this whole series on a cliffhanger. I'm not going to say how the fight ends, I'm just going to say that it ends very awesomely with a bunch of beautiful moments happening in between to kind of showcase that they have grown from how they start out in the beginning of the series. From Virgil going from this kind of meek, geeky kid that, although was very popular I guess, to a very confident young man that can take on the world and become the superhero of Legends. Even to the point of having his own future self being so powerful that even the Justice League cannot deny that he's one of the greatest superheroes in existence. And Gear going from simply Richie Foley, the comic foil sidekick that did nothing on the sidelines, to being one of the most technologically advanced superheroes in DC's own animated canon. Get on with it! For what I can honestly say about Static Shock, all of the characters that I've seen in the series have done a beautiful job of being portrayed. I honestly would say that, like a lot of people, my favorite characters weren't really the heroes even though they were voiced pretty well, with Phil, with Phil Lamar being the most prolific of them since he was Static. Me, my favorite characters were always either Ebon, voiced by... E Ivan Ivans, Ivans. I'm sorry if I butchered his name. For his portrayal of Ivan, because of how slick and smooth he was with how he was taunting the heroes, with all the cold sayings to catch you later, flat boy, and just commanding that force and all of that beautifulness of him being the ultimate villain of the series even if he wasn't in every episode you could just feel his presence just seeping through the shadows as if he knew he was running dakota without having the power to and when it wasn't him i always kind of found myself attached to side characters like how i was attached to anansi the spider due to my own personal attachments as a storyteller finding that whole concept kind of fascinating and really quite enjoyable to pretty much say with storytellers, you have the power to become a great hero. And with other assorted characters such as Aquamarina, a one-note villain that kind of does have a tragic backstory that was in both seasons 1, 2, and 4, or Talon, another reoccurring villain who also kind of has a slightly tragic backstory, and even certain other minor characters such as Time Zone, a bang baby that can go throughout history and time just throughout the simple thought or recalibration of her molecules, or simply the Nightbreed. And who are the Nightbreed, you might be asking? Well, I could say it, but I think it would be more poignant if the characters say what the so, Nightbreed Gail, is. So, how did a nice girl like you end up so, uh, metahuman? <sighs> I guess just like everyone else. I was down at the docks the night the police tried to stop the gang war. Nobody realized the kind of chemicals they were storing down there. And then it happened. The Big Bang. Not only were we all changed, but some of us got a really bad surprise the next morning. The sun had turned deadly for us. It could reduce us to ashes. We ran for any dark place we could find. That's how we met each other. Brickhouse, Fade, Tech, and me. And we weren't the only ones. Throughout most of the struggles that are visible throughout how all these characters are made, from the Nightbreed also being a creation of Dwayne McDuffie, which goes to a darker light in the comics like how most other portrayals are, this is no exception to how beautifully well done the series can be made in the right hands. 
When you are given the opportunity to make something this wonderful, you do not slouch. You do not give in to something. And this is something I loved about the series. Because no matter how goofy it got, no matter how silly it was, they never once tried to pull their punches. Every moment that they were on screen, that they tried to give everything their final push. All of this. They wanted to give it to everyone straight. There was no pulling punches except to do small kitty jokes because you can't show blood in a kid's show without it being comedic. You can't do many things in a TV show from what happens within history. I can understand that. But for a creator like Dwayne McDuffie to pretty much say, I want to give life to something that a lot of people didn't know that well about, I can understand that better than anyone. And I applaud him for making the series. And so, far, and so far, all I can say is, I am sorry every day that he is dead. I wanted him to make more. I wanted him to create more. I wanted him to do more with the series. I did. But when I found out that he passed away a few years ago, I was one of the few that was depressed as hell. Which is why for this whole showcase of Static Shock, I cannot unbiasedly say anything bad about this due to how wonderful this was for me. For V, he feels the same way. For Atom Kal, that annoying asshole, he feels that way too. Many people that worked for Culture Clash X too, some of them feel that way alongside me. But that's not all that's been dived into for this series. For as much as we can say or do about this whole thing, there are some negative things about the series, such as the whole kitty measure of it. I may not want to always agree with Channel Awesome on things, but when they say quotes that are right, they mean it. When they were talking about how Don Bluth was saying that you can show the darkest imagery possible as long as it comes up with a happy ending, I can agree with that. But there are moments in time with the series where they just kind of drop the ball in like a small amount of episodes. Not all of them, just like five episodes they drop the ball and make it too cutesy and kitty. And that's not the writer's fault, nor is it the animator's fault. It just happened. Still, that was at least a small bit of the negative that goes along with the overall positive that comes out from this show. The main, the main characters are wonderful, the side characters are great, the minor characters are memorable. No matter what episode you watch, you'll always look out for that minor character, at least as an easter egg. No matter what scene you're watching, no matter what episode you're watching, you will find the one that will stick with you the most. And it will make you so hooked on the show, you'll watch it over and over again, even when you're a grown-ass adult with children. This is one of the most beautiful series that I have seen growing up and still growing up even in my adult years still looking at this with such beauty and wonder that i would wholeheartedly want to see a reboot of this done immediately in fact there has been news and confirmation of people going back and forth saying that there's been a giant reboot in the works and if this is all true I will be one of the most happiest multiracial men in existence. Even more so than I was when V met Cece. Spoilers. Spoilers? What spoilers? So what would I give this entire series from just Static Shock before we dive into what Atom Kyle wants to talk about, whatever his annoying ass wants to say. For me, personally, I want to say that this show itself is so good, it deserves a perfect score. But nothing is perfect, unfortunately. So for just me, I don't know about anyone else that might review it in the future, but at least for me, I would give all of Static Shock from seasons 1 to season 4 a 12.8 out of 13. I wanted to give this a perfect score beyond all imagination. Trust me, I do. But if you want to give something real recognition, you also have to admit that nothing is perfect. 
Nothing that is worth watching is supposed to be perfect. You're supposed to find the flaws. You're supposed to see all of the hints and tricks, Easter eggs, all the failures, animation fails, all of those. You're supposed to witness all of those things if you love it that much. And I love the hell out of this TV series. However, even though I'm closing, uh, closing out on this whole series, I'm going to say this. I have never seen a series that has been so beautiful that even I feel like shedding tears of joy for just viewing this from start to finish. I honestly wish that the series never ended where I could at least grow old and still watch the series with my own grandkids as they go into a new generation of it. And before I get all emotional and start crying, I'm going to end it here and just say that I hope you guys look forward to part two because I'm just going to go cry in the corner. This has been TC from the Black Pyramid and you know what? Where's my hat? Dr. Todd will be whipping up another batch of his antidote. Only now that I'm a genius again, I think I'll whip us up a little cure for the cure. Yeah, they can't get rid of us that easily.